Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Weight Neutral Nutrition Podcast. I am your host, Devin Dirksen. I'm super excited that you're joining me today. I have an, another awesome guest episode coming at you today. I'm joined by Brianna Theus, and she is a Black registered dietitian based in southwestern Connecticut who works with folks who struggle with eating disorders and disordered eating. Her goal is to help people develop a better relationship with food, their body, and physical activity. She specializes in BIPOC clients whom she helps navigate those same goals with an emphasis on how white supremacy shows up in their lives, specifically in nutrition and healthcare. She helps them embrace their culture and lean into enjoying their cultural foods. So welcome to the show, Brianna. Super excited to have you. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, just let us know, like, tell us everything about you. I gave you a brief introduction there, but love yeah. to know more about how you came to be a dietitian and how you came to specialize in what you do. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I am very excited to be here. Um, I wanted to be a pastry chef um, when I was first kind of deciding what I was going to go to school for. And my parents were like, I'm very lucky that my parents paid for my college. And at the same time, because they were paying, they were like, no, you're not going to do that. We want <laughs> you to have like a quote unquote better education. Um, also, side note, my parents are both from Haiti. So they're they're immigrants in this country. So they wanted to they wanted me to have an education that would be um like, you know, that would that would be good for me and and have me able to take care of myself and not have to work long hours and things like that. So I I get where they were I get where they were coming from. Um but so the next thing around food um, is nutrition. I think I always love the science, love cooking, love learning everything about what it is, why it is, how things kind of like go together to make a meal. Um, so I ended up going to school to become a dietitian. Uh, I've been a dietitian for about four and a half years now, I believe. And I've been an eating disorder dietitian for almost four years now. So it's like basically most of my career, I've been an eating disorder dietitian. And I am so happy that I found my way to doing the work that it is I do now, because I don't know how it is in Canada, but in America, our school systems um, for nutrition, we don't talk about eating disorders all that much at all. Uh, we're mostly talking about uh, like clinical nutrition, so people being in the hospital and how to manage weight, like weight management is a big thing in our education. The Mediterranean diet is a big thing in our education. So it's basically like we're taught to help people lose weight and eat in the Mediterranean diet way that focuses on very specific foods that not everybody eats um, as part of their culture. Um, so I some I was doing school nutrition and I had a lot of a lot of free time, a lot of breaks. I was kind of bored most of the time, to be honest. And I was just listening to a bunch of different podcasts and I came across Christy Harrison's podcast about eating disorders. And that's pretty much where I started learning about eating disorders a little bit more. Um, and then I got a job working in eating disorders and it's been something that I've loved ever since. And it's helped me to even think about the way that I grew up and what I've learned about food from my parents, from their families, um, from the media. I think a lot of the time for, for BIPOC people in general, but probably for a lot of people, um, there's definitely a struggle with not wanting to stand out. Um, especially if somebody has an accent or if somebody like is whatever makes somebody like quote unquote different from the rest of the world, trying to fit in as much as possible. So that always came with needing to have the best grades in my classes, needing to be the politest, needing to dress the best, um, and then also needing to look the best. So that would come with my parents always talking about weight always talking about food and nutrition. Um, and then that was emphasized in my schooling as well. Um, so I am very glad that I, I stumbled across Christy Harrison's podcast and then it kind of changed the trajectory for myself personally and for my career as well. 
Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. And for listeners who may not be familiar, Christy Harrison is the uh, author of Anti-Diet. So um, just as an aside there, because I'm not sure, like my listeners are lay people, they might not know. (laughs) But uh, yes, that's great. And I think she definitely is one of like the bigger voices in there, um, in the anti-diet space at the moment anyway. Um, and yeah, I feel like you, you talked about a lot of things, but for me, what really was standing out was the emphasis on the Mediterranean diet, because I think that this is something that I have really been seeing an increase in almost. I think people like, as they try to be like, oh, I'm not focusing on weight loss. They're like, I'm just going to do this Mediterranean thing. And it's like, well, first of all, like, yeah, that's like a very specific set of food. And it's from like one tiny area in Europe. And it's like, um, I don't know. There's nothing like that wrong with it. But like, did you want to speak maybe on like the accessibility of it? And like, uh, sorry, this is just coming up for me as we're talking. I know this wasn't yeah. questions. But uh, <laughs> yeah, like it's, I don't know. To, to me, it just like seems diet culture anyway, even though I know that's not the point, but, and I feel like people are kind of latching onto it right now. Yeah. Well, I think the diet culture aspect comes from the fact that we're asking every single person, no matter what their culture identity is, no matter what foods they enjoy, what foods they grew up with to eat a specific type of way. Like everybody has to eat this way in order to quote unquote, be healthy. Um, so it, like, like you were saying, it's not accessible for everybody. So, um, it's expensive, but Mm -hmm. a lot of the foods like nuts, there's beans, beans aren't that expensive, but there's nuts in there. Um, olive oil, there's like lentil, like so many different things in that diet are not accessible for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And not everybody has access to fresh fruits and vegetables either, which I think the Mediterranean diet has a big emphasis on as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also, so with the fact that we're asking people to give up their cultural food, so it's basically telling them that white rice isn't, isn't good for you. You need to be eating, um, brown rice. You need to be eating, uh, quinoa. You need to be eating any other type of grain instead of the white rice, white rice. I can't say that (laughs) white rice that you grew up on, um, that you grew up eating and things like that. So white rice isn't, isn't inherently bad for you just because it's it's white rice and similar to like white potatoes like white foods aren't bad for you um maybe they don't have as much nutrition as brown rice would but that doesn't mean you have to only eat brown rice um especially if you don't like i when i was growing up and again my parents are from haiti so we always eat a, a lot of rice rice is my favorite food white rice specifically and when i was in school learning about the mediterranean diet i went back home and i was like you guys need to only cook brown rice white rice is not good for us we can't eat it at all so we changed and i don't i don't know why they listened to me but we changed <laughs> all of our food to brown rice instead And the sauce with the brown rice, just like the, all the components of Haitian food with brown rice, it did not taste good. Like Mm -hmm. it did not taste the same, but I was like, we need to eat it because it's healthier. So I, I like all of us, none of us really liked it. So we were all just kind of like chugging, chugging through it, getting ourselves through the meal, not enjoying it because that is what was like, quote unquote, healthy and good for us. Um, And then finally, I learned that white rice is perfectly fine to eat and I'm able to get fiber in other ways. It doesn't just have to come from rice. Um, So things like that. And then also, I guess maybe moving away from the Mediterranean diet a little bit, but even like things like quinoa, things like um, avocados, Mm -hmm. um, really any, any type of food that's deemed more of like a super food or like a food from other people's cultures the more that people are are going towards it the more that people are trying to buy it incorporate it into their dishes the more expensive it gets and the people who eat it traditionally aren't able to then afford what is a part of their culture so there are cultures who eat and even even my culture eats avocado basically like every single meal but now that's not something that people are able to afford because the prices have just increased so much as well so those are some of the things that can happen when we're always leaning towards one specific way of eating or promoting a couple um a couple different 
foods here and there versus thinking about a whole perspective and thinking about how you can inco incorporate your cultural foods or incorporate foods that you grew up with into your diet. Yeah, totally. And I, I love that you mentioned like the white foods, because I think that was like a huge diet culture myth that he, like in my journey, I really like grasped on to. I was like, mm -hmm. I hate brown rice, but I have to eat it. Like I can eat potatoes. Like it was yeah. really um, a thing for me. I, th I don't know. I think that like 10 or 15 years ago, that was really a big thing of, of diet culture was like, don't eat white food. That's bad for you. Like, I don't know. It doesn't have any nutrients. Yeah. Um, so I like, I kind of forgot about that. And then you brought it up and I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. Cause that was a big thing. Um, but yeah, I do think it's really interesting. And I know like for me, I had a client come to me at one point and said she had, cause I'm not a dietitian. I'm just a, a holistic nutritionist and um she had said like I went to a dietitian because I thought like I was going to get help but she just told me that she, the this client was latina she said like I'm just not allowed to eat mexican food anymore and I was like well that's ridiculous like first of all but like it just kind of speaks to like the education around certain things and and those like biases that still exist in in the in the industry I guess yeah yeah that's that's really incredible to me to to assume that somebody isn't going to eat their foods <laughs> anymore, you know. isn't going to eat their culture foods. Like that doesn't even, it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> right. I know. So I just was like, don't, I don't know. Like I, because I'm not a dietitian, I don't say, like to say things like, don't listen to dietitians. But I was right. just like, that's like kind of rude. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. right. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm glad that she told me about it but anyway yeah. um so let's shift a little bit because we we want to talk about body image right and uh, you are an expert on body image so uh tell us like obviously like from an eating disorder perspective or just from a general population perspective um what do you think are the most important things for people to know about body image how does that affect different populations um uh, give us your expertise I guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure I feel like when we speak about body image, and this is in the nutrition eating disorder world, and also just like in the world in general, in society, when we're talking about body image, a lot of the time we're only talking about weight. Um, weight mm -hmm. is really probably at the center of body image. And I think it's it, like, it, it makes sense. It's important to make sure that we are talking about weight as well, um, because people in America, in America, I'm not sure what the what the Canadian ideals are, but in America, we have body image ideals that are one constantly changing, and two, a lot of the time focused around um, being thin, like being slim. Every once in a while, I think recently we had the like Kim Kardashian body ideal, curvy, um, big boobs, big butt. So people were getting uh, the BBL surgery um, mm -hmm. to be able mm -hmm. to look like Kim Kardashian. And now it's going into the quote unquote heroin chic, which is basically being very, very thin. And that is contributing to a lot of people trying to lose weight, a lot of people developing eating disorders in order to be able to fit into that, uh, that, that body image ideal. And when it comes to weight, also, what isn't talked about is that there are different ideals for different people in different cultures as well. So speaking about my culture for black people, the ideal is probably like, like thick. Um, so like, it's pretty similar to like thick, um, like wide hips, I guess, bigger, but um, maybe like thicker stomach, but also like slim if you know what I mean like it's it's I don't even know how to describe it but it's just it's thick is basically an ideal for for black people so it's also like how am I going to fit into the black ideal mm -hmm. and also the American body image ideal at the same time um so you have people, Black people, BIPOC people, or people, even LGBTQIA plus people who have different body image ideals. You have them kind of straddling the line of, am I going to 
pursue the American ideal? Am I going to pursue the cultural ideal that I'm in? Or am I just going to kind of stay how I am and not do anything about it? Um, but I'm, I'm curious, do you, what is the uh, Canadian body image ideal? I think it's very similar to the American ideal. Similar. And I think like most of my listeners are American, so they'll, they'll resonate with what you're saying. Um, but yeah, I think Canada just does whatever the U S is doing generally <laughs> speaking, I think. So um, yeah, I think like it, it may be a little bit different just because like Canada is more rural than, than the U S in a lot of ways, but, and so like access to food is a little bit different and, and therefore certain things are different, but I think it's, it's very much the same. And I, I know like my, my one friend texted me like a while ago and she was just like skinny as in again. And I was like, what are you talking about? Cause I don't know. I don't pay attention, but it's like you said, you know, it kind of transitioned from this like thick aesthetic to like hair with chic aesthetic yeah. and I was like what are these war like what are these words I don't know I try not to pay attention too closely to things like that but uh yeah. it's out there so yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's very ridiculous also like you're right like the wording that they use heroin chic like why <laughs> where is it coming from it makes no sense but yeah so <laughs> people are getting people were getting the BBLs look like Kim Kardashian. Now they're getting them removed oh. and also not recognizing that that could be like, that can have a lot of health impacts for somebody. And maybe for a celebrity, it could be a little bit easier and health impacts and also financial impacts. But for a celebrity, that's a lot easier. They have more access um, to finances. They have probably more access to doctors and things like that and someone to follow them and track them and for for everyday people we we don't have that um so it can cause a lot more stress on the body too to constantly be chasing those ideals as well um but aside from weight so the other body image things that I feel like don't get talked about all that often so those are going to be things like um religion how religion can impact body image and I think that one at least for me it's more closely tied to like covering up your body um and not not showing skin not showing not showing anything that could be looked at as immodest or that anybody could look at and be like and, and it will be like sensual for somebody um gender identity which I mentioned a little bit before race and age as well and then i'm sure there are a host of other things hair um there are a host of other things that can have an impact on body image that aren't just around weight mm -hmm. um colorism skin color that is definitely a really really big one um specifically in the black community but also just for anybody who is not white really so skin color I would say is probably really important to somebody's identity. Um, like part of my identity is literally that I'm black. Like you look at me and you can tell that I am, I am a black person because of my skin color. So that affects how I move in the world. That affects the choices I make. That affects uh, how people treat me. That affects what jobs I get. Um, so a lot of things are impacted by the way that I look in my skin color. Um, so there's discrimination based on skin color interracially, but there's also discrimination based on skin color intraracially. So that would be more colorism. So seeing light skinned people versus dark-skinned people and believing that the light-skinned people are better uh, for whatever reason. They're more qualified. They're more um, financially secure. Um, and that actually stems from racism in America, or not racism, slavery in America, which I guess is racism, but slavery in America. Um, so oftentimes the people who were darker skinned were sent out in the fields doing the harder work outside and people who were lighter skinned were kept in the house 
Um, mm -hmm. They were doing kind of like the, the household chores. They were doing the things that weren't as, um, as difficult or as hard on the body as the dark skinned folks. And they were seen as a, a little bit better than mm -hmm. the dark skinned people in that time. So that is continuing today, even in our own communities as Black people, but also in society as well. So we'll find that a lot of people who are who are brown, light-skinned brown, are um, you know chosen for jobs more, are looked at in a better light, and also not to say that they're they don't get discrimination as well because they still have discrimination. And dark skinned people have a lot harder, a lot harder time in that sense as well. Um, so when it comes to body image, we're seeing things like skin brightening, um, lightening creams. That's also popular with South Asians as well in the South Asian community. Um, we're seeing like bleaching of the skin in general because, again we're not we're wanting to be able to fit in right people want to be able to not be discriminated against discrimination increases stress it increases so many things it increases mental health issues so people are trying to do the things that they feel like they need to do in order to in order to fit in mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. I, when I lived in South Korea for a while, there was like the, the skin whitening creams everywhere. Mm. And I was like, what is this? Um, but then, you know, later on I was like, oh, I guess this is a thing. And yeah, it's just like, it's crazy. And, and I appreciate that you mentioned that because I think that when we talk about body image, when a lot of people talk about body image, they think like, how you talk to yourself or, you know, the, the self-talk and like the way you look in the mirror and, you know, body checking. I see that a lot as like people talking about body checking and it's like, it's so much bigger than that. Like it's so much more impacted by systemic factors than just like self-talk. So right. I think that that's like a really important thing is that, so then how can individuals, I guess, like whether they are in the BIPOC community or whatever, like how can you kind of try, try to reconcile these, these systemic things versus like your own personal experience and trying to feel better in your own body? Do you have tips around yeah. that? Yeah, it's really, really tricky. And I think body image is tricky in general because of the fact that it's so, it's so rampant in society, in the world in general, we're always talking about bodies. We're always commenting on people for like being part of the queer community for being mm -hmm. disabled for for being of a certain religion for having whatever features um so we're always looking for that proximity to whiteness that proximity to those european ideals um so it's really tricky to kind of be in a society be in this space and also work on your own body image at the same time um I will say what I think this to me, I think is probably the most important thing um, that is building community. So community with people who look like you, community who people with people who maybe community with people who are queer, if you're a part of the queer community, um, community with people in the same religion as you, uh, community and pe with people who are even like BIPOC, but also if you want to go deeper into it for the Black community, for the Indian community, for the Muslim community, like any anything in uh, Indigenous community, being in community with people and being able to talk about these issues. Um, even if you don't feel comfortable talking about these issues, just seeing people who look like you and being able to be like, oh, like this person looks like me and, and they're pretty cool and they're not changing anything about themselves. And I, I still like them for who they are and what they're doing. And I'm not, I don't like them based off of how they look. Um, so having people to support you, to be able to talk to about these things, but also just being able to be with people to just kind of like sit around and, and do whatever and do everyday life together. Um, also therapy. I think therapy is important. I will also say therapy is not for everybody. Not everybody is able to afford it. It's not always accessible for everybody. Um, therapy can really be helpful in being able to process 
and talk about maybe the trauma from racism, discrimination, ableism, anything like that, fat phobia that you're that you have or are currently and probably are currently experiencing. Um, it's good to be able to, you know, have some coping skills to use that aren't going to be detrimental to you and to your health. Um, and I know that there are some other other things besides therapy. So I know that there are people who will do like like sound sound baths um, or yoga or anything like that, like anything that you can find that helps you to kind of um, be able to go into yourself and relax and kind of like let out all of the negative thoughts that are consuming you and then being able to, to reframe some of those thoughts that are coming up for you. So that could be anything like the world is telling me that my body isn't good enough for xyz reasons and coming up with reasons why your body is good enough um so that you have some of those things to kind of combat those thoughts when they're coming in as well yeah totally well i think i really love that you mentioned community because i think um <laughs> i'm white obviously i think that we don't do that we are very much like, this is an individualist problem. This is my problem. Like, not a thing for us. But I think for anyone, like, we should be doing that. It shouldn't yeah. be an individual problem. And I think a lot of these problems come from an, a very individualist outlook on on health and wellness and body image in society. So um, I, I really like that tip a lot. That's really helpful for people, I think. Yeah. And honestly, it doesn't even have to be a community where it's for people who who look like you. It could honestly be a community for if you like to go hiking, you have some hiking buddies um, mm -hmm. that you're in community with. It's also just a way to not be isolated, too. So you have people who are going to help you to go out, maybe be in nature, do things that that help you feel, um, you, you know, just like feel like you're a part of something, too. Mm hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And that might be a great way for people, yeah, to like connect with nature, connect with um, themselves in a different way. And yeah, just like, <laughs> I think, I think community is really important. And I think it's really underrated for people, especially when they're thinking about health. It just feels very like, what can you do to better your health? And it's like, yeah. well, you know, that's not necessarily just like the be all end all of things. Yeah, I and I know you said you're a holistic nutritionist and I, I call myself more of like a holistic dietitian, too, because that's something that we talk about. So we'll talk about social health because mm -hmm. that's that's really important and it has a big impact on things as well as talking about like sleep and stress and maybe sleep is sleep is, I guess, more individualized, but also like talking about stress, how you can um get support from your community when you know you are feeling stressed or how you can get support from your community when you're having trouble with eating or when you're having trouble with whatever. And, and, and that's why, that's why it's really important. Yeah. And I think it's like a tangible thing people can do. I think a lot of times when we talk about like systemic things that affect individual health, people sometimes can feel a little bit despaired um, in ways like, oh, there's nothing I can do. And it's like, well, you know, seeking community is something like tangible that you can do to try to address these problems, I think, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Awesome. Well, uh, do you have any other tips or resources for people? I know I always like to share, especially around body image, the resource of the Body is Not an Apology book, along with the workbook. I think that's um, my number one resource for my clients. But do you have any other um, really great like body image resources or ways people can learn more or dive deeper into body image? Yeah, so there is a book called Fearing the Black Body um, by Sabrina String. So that goes into the racist origins of body image and, and why black bodies are feared. There's also a new book that just came out. I have it right next to me because I want to remember the title. Um, <laughs> such a cute kitty. <laughs> yeah. He likes to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um this book is called It's Always Been Ours, 
Ooh. rewriting the story of black women's bodies by jessica wilson putting it in my camera um this was written by a dietitian and she talks about um black women's bodies as well and kind of how how we can reclaim them and reclaim our our joy as well so those those ones are more specific to black folks but i think everybody can get a get something out of the book as well awesome yeah jessica's book is definitely on my list um i i love following her i think it's a really great uh topic and i appreciate you sharing those with us um Last question, question I ask every single guest. Sorry, my kitty is still here. He's drinking my water. So (laughs) Um, what would you tell your 18-year-old self about health or life or body image or anything at all? I think that I would tell my 18-year-old self that my Blackness is my superpower. Um, And because I think I grew up without that community, I... I grew up in a very like white suburban town. All of my friends were white growing up. So I felt kind of more isolated and I didn't really learn anything about my identity or heritage or anything like that growing up. And now that I've been able to do some more work, I think I found a lot of, um, I've, I've found comfort in my identity and I think, and I, I love being black. So I I would tell that to myself to even like, even if at 18 years old, I'm not looking into it, at least I know in the future, it's going to be something that's, that's coming and something that is uh, really important to me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Brianna, for sharing that with us and for being here with us today and sharing your knowledge. I think people are going to love this episode. People always love the body image episodes, but this is a great (laughs) uh, spin on it. Uh, Where can people find you and connect with you more, whether they want to work with you or whether they just want to learn more about what you talk about? Yeah. So people can find me on Instagram. My handle is at the Celestial Life RD or my website is thecelestiallife.com. Perfect. We will link all of that in the show notes and the YouTube description for people so they can find it. And uh, yeah, just thanks so much for being here. Great. Thank you so much.